Hello and welcome to This Week in Amateur Radio. This is a weekly newscast where we talk about the latest amateur radio news, events, and technical information. We also occasionally interview special guests from the amateur radio community. If you're new to amateur radio, or just interested in finding out more, then This Week in Amateur Radio is the perfect place to start. We are approaching the beginning of our 24th year of service to the amateur radio community around the world. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1241 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The new general class question pool has been released to the public. We will have all the details you should know. Time signal station WWVH is looking for a new chief engineer. That's in Hawaii, by the way. We will tell you how you can apply. Santa is on the air right now on many bands and modes. We will tell you how you can talk to him. The director general of the BBC is floating plans to shut down terrestrial radio and television broadcasting by 2030. The Alexanderson alternator in Sweden will be sparking its way on the air. Under the callsign SAQ, it will be sending out a Christmas message to all amateurs. One commissioner at the FCC has the survival of AM broadcasting as his top priority. SpaceX's plan to launch another 30,000 Starlink satellites is being hindered by the FCC. We will tell you why. The largest radio telescope on the planet is nearing completion. And, did you know that there are zombie satellites swirling over your head? There are many, both commercial and amateur. We will tell you all about them and a lot more in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO. And get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about how the latest editions of Windows are just versions of old Windows with a new coat of paint, and will talk about everyday uses of encryption on the internet. Australia's own Anno Benchop VK6FLAB will talk about attenuators, the missing link. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY returns with another edition of the a n n i s o n Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will take us back to the mid 1940s and the different and final version of the amateur band. Allocations. Our special Christmas segment this week comes to us from the late Bill Barron, N2FNH, who will tell us a story he calls a Christmas packet. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Keeps his feet on the ground again this week as he goes on the rails. This week he talks about using your handy talkie on the train. And we will have the late Steve Mendelson, W2ML, in a talk given at the Dayton Hamvention years ago, where he recounts his long broadcast career with ABC Radio and CBS Television News, traveling all around with world with reporters like Walter Cronkite. He relates how his entire career was due to amateur radio. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air. Right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio in soon to be snow covered Albany, New York, I'm Paul Zinger. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Reporting from just outside the capital of New York State in Glenmont, New York, this is Bob, W3BOO, Boo Radio. And reporting from our amateur radio station in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where our LED powered outside Christmas tree is doing its thing, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, In the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where autumn has been, shall we say, most unusual, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, 
The National Conference of Volunteer Examiner Coordinators Question Pool Committee has released the 2023-2027 to General Class FCC Element 3 Syllabus and Question Pool to the public. With more details, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, reporting from League Headquarters. The new General Question Pool is effective July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2027. And that new pool incorporates some significant changes compared to the last version. Its 432 questions were modified slightly to improve wording and to replace distractors. 51 new questions were generated and 73 questions were eliminated. This resulted in a reduction of 22 questions, bringing the total number of questions in the pool down from 454. The level of difficulty of questions is more balanced and the techniques and practices addressed have been updated. The pool is available as a Microsoft Word document and PDF. The single graphic required for the new general question pool is available within the documents or separately as a PDF and JPEG files. The newly revised pool must be used for general class license exams starting July 1st, 2023, said ARRL VEC manager Maria Soma, AB1FM, who is a member of the question pool committee. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. New test designs will be available to the ARRL volunteer examiners on that date. The ARRL VEC will supply its officially appointed field stocked volunteer examiner teams with the new general exam booklet designs around mid June. General class examination candidates preparing for their exams using the ninth edition of the general class license manual and or the sixth edition of the ARRL's general Q&A are encouraged to test by or before June 30th, 2023. New editions of ARRL licensing publications will be available in May for exams taken on or after July 1st, 2023. Listeners around the world, tune in regularly to WWV and WWVH, the radio station of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, for various voice announcements, including the time. Now the United States government agency hopes qualified engineers will tune into an important job opening it has for an engineering position based in Hawaii. Radio station WWVH, which is part of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is looking to hire an engineer in charge. In addition to maintenance of the station on Kauai, Hawaii, the job requires regular communication with the NIST's Time and Frequency Division in Boulder, Colorado. The engineer is responsible for the four radio transmission systems on 2.5, 5, 10, and 15 megahertz, which are required to be on the air 99.7% of the time. One or two electronic technicians will report to the engineer in charge. For more details about the job and whether you qualify, visit www.usajobs.gov. Again, that's www.usajobs.gov. As Christmas approaches, many amateur radio clubs carry out an annual tradition of helping kids talk directly to Santa Claus while he is still at the North Pole before his big ride. John Ross, KD8IDJ, visited with some of the clubs who are helping Santa get on the air this year and files this special report. On Saturday, December 10th, 2022, the Wallingford Amateur Radio Group in Connecticut will connect kids to Santa and Mrs. Claus via amateur radio during their Calling Santa event. The group organizes the event in cooperation with the Wallingford Health Department, Youth and Social Services, and support from Amateur Radio Digital Communications, that's ADRC, and a grant to the Meridian Amateur Radio Club. Mark President Dr. Ed Snyder, W1YSM, said this will be the third year for Calling Santa. The location is ideal for this event, said Dr. Snyder. Our communications van will be there, and the kids can go inside and talk to Santa and Mrs. Claus on a real amateur radio. There will also be a fire truck, coloring books, crayons, and allergy-safe snacks. Each child will receive a full-color certificate signed by the Clauses. Already in operation for the 16th consecutive year, the 3916 Nets are hosting the Santa Net on 3916 megahertz. Kids can walk and talk to Santa via nightly amateur radio at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, now through Christmas Eve, December 24, 2022. The shortwave net welcomes radio amateurs to help their children and grandchildren get on the air and talk to Santa. Third-party rules and regulations, though, will apply. 
and the Big Bend Amateur Radio Club, covering the Big Bend area of West Texas and based in Alpine, will have their 15th annual Santa Night ready to go on December 14th, 2022. Local two-meter repeaters are used to make the connection to Santa. The club highlights that Santa Net introduces kids to ham radio. The event is promoted through the local elementary schools and its teachers. Ham participates get a uh, candy cane and a card commemorating the radio contact with Santa. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. The ARRL Special Events Station Database is updated regularly and includes other Christmas and holiday-themed on-the-air events. You can search the database at www.arrl.org forward slash special hyphen event hyphen stations. And use keyword searches such as Christmas or holiday. Fill out the special events application form at www.arrl.org forward slash special hyphen events hyphen application to add your event. The Director General of the British Broadcasting Corporation has announced that the BBC could turn off its terrestrial radio and TV services within the next decade. Tim Davies said a switch-off of broadcasts will and should happen over time, and that the BBC should be active in planning for it. He said the corporation needed to own a move to the Internet future with greater urgency as he looked towards 2030 and beyond. In a speech to the Royal Television Society, he said, Imagine a world that is Internet only, where broadcast TV and radio are being switched off, and choice is infinite. There's still a lot of live linear viewing, but it's all been delivered online. He suggested that's a bad way to switch off could happen, where access to the BBC is no longer universal or unaffordable for too many. Where the gateway to content is owned by a well-capitalized overseas company, he added. In order to avoid this, the country must close gaps and guarantee accessibility for all, he said describing efforts by the government to improve access to fixed-line broadband and 5G or 4G as critical. The Director General also called for serious public service investment if it's to compete with international rivals in the coming years. Mr. Davies said the BBC needs more money to support its world service and to avoid further cuts. Some 382 jobs at the service, often regarded as a source of soft power for the UK, are being lost as part of a plan to move to the digital laid offering with Arabic and Persian radio services among those closing. He said plans to discuss the issue with the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and warned that Russia and China are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in state-backed services. We have a choice to make, he added. The BBC has said that due to a freeze in the license fee and inflation, it faces a 400 million pound funding gap by 2026 and 2027, and must make savings. He and Mr. Davies said UK media are in a period of real jeopardy with a life-threatening challenge to the local media and the cultural and social benefits they provide. The threat is not about if there's a choice, it's about the scope of future choices and the future factors that shape it, he added. During the speech, Davy prescribed a blueprint for what the media market was the next decade could look at. He said, as we look towards the 2030s, we're open-minded about the future of funding mechanics. But as we're clear, that's critical. We'll need a universal solution that fuels UK public service growth, not stifles it, while offering audiences outstanding value. Of course, the latest settlement did include the increased debt facility for BBC Studios, which was welcome. Alongside commercial plans, they'll keep cutting costs to invest and attract more partner investment as well as the latest deal that they announced with Disney on Doctor Who. But under the most ambitious scenarios, it will not change the need for serious public service investment. Earlier this year, former Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries announced the license fee would be frozen at £159 for the next two years. She said she wanted to find new funding models for the current deal expires in 2027, as it's completely outdated. The new minister, Michelle Donnellan, said this week it was impossible to sustain the BBC on its current finance fee model, confirming she plans to continue the government's review into the annual charge. Mr. Davies said the BBC politicians, regulators, and wider industry must work together to leave a legacy of a thriving world leading UK media market or accept on our watch a slow decline.
On Christmas Eve morning, December 24, 2022, the Alexander Grimmiton Friendship Association in southern Sweden will be on the air sending out a special Christmas message to the world. The event will begin at 0830 CET or 0730 UTC with the startup and tuning of the Alexanderson alternator transmitter through Grimmerton radio station, call sign SAQ. The transmission will begin at 0900 CET or 0800 UTC with the 98-year-old 200-kilowatt Alexanderson alternator on 17.2 kilohertz CW. Grimmerton radio station SK6SAQ will be QRV on the following frequencies. 3.535 MHz CW, 7.035 MHz CW, 14.035 MHz CW, 3.755 MHz SSB, and 7.140 MHz SSB. QSL reports can be sent to SK6SAQ via email at info at alexander.n.se. The event will also be live streamed on the Alexander SAQ Grimmerton Friendship Association YouTube channel. The Alexanderson alternator transmitter is the only remaining example of early pre-electronic radio transmitter technology. The station, built in 1922 through 1924, has been preserved as a historical site. From the 1920s through the 1940s, it was used to transmit telegram traffic by Morse code to North America and throughout the world during World War II. More information about the December 24th Christmas Eve event and the transmitter can be found at the Grimmerton Radio Station website. One FCC commissioner is on a mission to quell the rumors of the coming death of AM radio. The good news is that AM radio has a future, which means the band isn't going to be reallocated anytime soon. According to Radio World magazine, those were the words of FCC commissioner Nathan Symington, speaking recently at the 79th Annual Convention of the National Association of Farm Broadcasting. Symington said that for one thing, AM radio is an integral part of the life of of the more than 3 million farmers in the United States who rely on it daily for vital information. He called it the essential spine of the emergency alert system. He said that despite beliefs by many that it has been killed off by more advanced technology, AM radio is here to stay for the foreseeable future, especially for those who live on the kind of farm where he himself grew up. He said he is against any move the FCC might be pressured to consider to reallocate the band. He told convention attendees that people listen to radio in their cars or trucks, particularly rural radio. That's just how it is. And if people lose the ability to tune into AM on their cars, well, there goes AM radio. He went on to say that while satellite is a good option, it is too expensive. He said AM radio is not just free, but carries an important emergency signaling infrastructure. In his opinion, the best option for AM radio's future is to simply preserve it for the generations to come. In a further development, an influential United States lawmaker has joined the push to talk automakers out of eliminating broadcast AM radios and new cars. Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts has asked the car companies to respond in writing about their intentions regarding AM and FM radio. He acknowledged that electric vehicles can cause electromagnetic interference with AM signals, but encourage car makers to pursue some of the remedies they have devised. The car companies include General Motors, Jaguar, Kia, BMW, and American Honda. U.S. regulators have pushed back on SpaceX's plan to launch an additional 30,000 satellites into orbit that are needed to expand its Starlink space internet service. The Federal Communications Commission cited concerns about orbital debris and space safety, though did grant permission for Elon Musk's company to build, deploy, and operate up to 7,500 Starlink satellites. SpaceX's Starlink, a fast-growing network of more than 3,500 satellites in low-Earth orbit, has tens of thousands of users in the United States so far, with consumers paying at least $599 for a user terminal and $110 a month for service. The FCC approved the Starlink operation. SpaceX plans to deploy up to 4,425 first-generation satellites and has already launched more than 3,300. 
SpaceX has sought approval to operate a network of 29,988 satellites to be known as its second generation or Gen 2 Starlink constellation to beam internet to areas with little or no internet access. Our action will allow SpaceX to begin deployment of Gen 2 Starlink, which will bring next-generation satellite broadband to Americans nationwide, the FCC said in its approval order, adding it will enable worldwide satellite broadband service, helping to close the digital divide on a global scale. The FCC said its decision will protect other satellite and terrestrial operators from harmful interference and maintain a safe space environment, and protect spectrum and orbital resources for future use. In August, a U.S. appeals court upheld the 2021 decision of the FCC to approve a SpaceX plan to deploy some Starlink satellites at a lower Earth orbit than planned as part of its push to offer space-based broadband internet. In September, SpaceX challenged the FCC decision to deny it $885.5 million in rural broadband subsidies. FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel said in August, Starlink's technology has real promise, but that it could not meet the program's requirements, citing data that showed a steady decline in speeds over the past year and casting the service's price as too steep for consumers. NASA has also raised concerns about space safety surrounding SpaceX's Starlink constellation. In a five-page letter submitted to the FCC earlier this year, the U.S. Space Agency warned of the potential for a significant increase in the frequency of conjunction events and possible impacts to NASA's science and human spaceflight missions. The following item was recorded a number of years ago by Mr. Random Access Thought, Bill Barron, N2FNH. We thought you would like to enjoy this Ham Radio Christmas item once again. This time around, remastered by Bill himself at the N2FNH Studios. So here now, for your enjoyment, is A Christmas Packet. A Christmas Packet, with apologies to Clement C. Moore. Twas the night before Christmas, the moon shone so bright, its light on the snow was a beautiful sight. I sat down in my easy chair with a sigh. Through the window I stared at the stars in the sky. Suddenly I woke to a racket. I knew right away something came in on the packet. I rose from my chair and went back to my shack. While the radio kept up its clackety-clack. A brap burst out of my TNC. The headline said that it was for me. This must be a joke, was the thought in my head. D.E. the North Pole was the way that it read. I knew that it must be one of the boys, so I tried to connect to the source of the noise. So quickly I typed, con ok on, but just as fast as it came, it was gone. Then from the parlor I heard a soft thump, and then heard the front door close with a bump. Puzzled, I went to the living room door. And there my eyes were drawn down to the floor. I couldn't believe what I saw by the tree. Earplugs for my wife and a new rig for me. That sneaky old elf, he pulled quite a gag. While I was in the back, he snuck in with his bag. The few minutes I was on, packety pack, gave him just enough time to empty his sack. Then from my set, I heard one last zap. I turned and was back in my shack in a snap. I thought I knew what this message might be. So as I sat down to look at the CRT, this line I read by the screen's tree light. Merry Christmas to all, and to all, a good night. Saturday, December 3rd, 2022, was Skywarn Recognition Day an event that recognizes Skywarn volunteers for their contribution to public safety. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with more. SRD was observed by several National Weather Service locations across the United States. Amateur radio volunteers set up temporary operations from forecasting headquarters to make contacts with other stations to demonstrate their readiness to operate in emergency conditions and to act as observers for the National Weather Service. As of the last count, there were over 4,700 Skywarn spotters taking part in SRD. Near Los Angeles, California, the National Weather Service office located in Oxnard, volunteers set up six stations on different radio frequencies and operated through the day under simulated emergency conditions. Several members of the general public, though, visited the National Weather Service office during that exercise. ARRL headquarters participating as WX1AW was activated by ARRL Emergency Management Assistant Ken Bailey, K1FUG, during SRD. WX1AW was active on 40 through 10 meters using single sideband and FT8 modes and monitored local VHF and UHF repeaters. 
And the 2022 National Weather Service Spotter of the Year Award was given to Brian Loper, WX5CSS of Atlanta, Texas. The award noted that Loper is very active with the amateur radio network and weather community within the ARC LA Tex region and is always reliable in providing weather reports. Loper is also, by the way, an ARRL member. And our thanks to Jeff Reinhart, AA6JR, Public Information Coordinator for the ARRL Santa Barbara section, for contributing to this story. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Radio amateurs participating as Skywarn volunteers assist the National Weather Service with real-time observations of adverse weather conditions that pose an imminent threat to life and property. Those alerts may include tornadoes, water spouts, damaging hail, blizzard conditions, sleet, strong winds, heavy rainfalls and flooding, dust storms, damage assessment, and other significant anomalies. NWS personnel can utilize information from ham radio operators to issue alerts or assess threat levels to areas that may be affected by abnormal conditions. QRZ.com has an event planned to warm up the winter season in the Northern Hemisphere, where things can get a little chilly. So this year, QRZ.com has offered to heat things up. The action is already underway. It started on the 1st of December. The QRZ Winter Ops Award celebrates the 12 days of QRZ. To be eligible, hams need to log 12 confirmed contacts on any 12 days from now through February 28th, 2023. The certificate is being offered for the first time as a holiday gift from QRZ's founder, Fred Lloyd, AA7BQ. Fred writes on the website that this one's going to be very popular this season. We can't wait for people to show them to us hanging in their shacks. Hopefully, it will keep the holiday spirit and confirmation of those dozen QSOs going strong into the new year. At the request of the ARRL, the Federal Communications Commission granted a waiver allowing amateur radio operators to participate in a special event commemorating the 81st anniversary of National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day. On December 6th and 7th, ham radio operators were able to make crossband contacts with the battleship Iowa, now moored in the port of Los Angeles in San Pedro, California, using the call sign NEPM. The FCC waiver was conditioned on participating amateur stations, one, monitoring the following three federal frequencies, 14,375 kHz, 18,170 kHz, and 21,460 kilohertz. Two, responding on spectrum allocated to the amateur service and only at the request of event organizers. Three, operating consistent with the privileges of their amateur licenses. And four, limiting communications to the period beginning 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, December 6, 2022, through 8.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, December 7, 2022. Additionally, all other related commission regulations that are applicable to amateur operators will continue to apply, for example, mode, maximum power, and license class. Because this was a crossband operation, ARRL reminded participating amateur stations to monitor their transmit frequency as well as the ship station's out-of-band frequency to protect against inadvertently interfering with other amateur communications. The waiver included that in addition to the skills gained by amateur operators who participated in the event, this specific Remembrance Day carried particular importance given the ever-decreasing number of World War II veterans able to participate each year. This special event offers radio amateurs the opportunity to participate in a remembrance that honors the sacrifice of all those present at Pearl Harbor on that infamous day, and in memory of all those who lost their lives during World War II, defending our freedoms, said Bart Yankee, W9JJ, ARRL Radio Sport and Regulatory Information Manager. More information about the event and the QSL procedures can be found on the website of the Battleship Iowa Amateur Radio Association, an ARRL-affiliated club, 
at https colon forward slash forward slash b i a r a dot o r g. Operations on both days were from 1500 to 2400 UTC. The Battleship Iowa Amateur Radio Association president is Doug Dowds, W6HB, an ARRL Life member. National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day is commemorated each year on December 7th. The Battleship Iowa was decommissioned in October 1990 and currently serves as a museum battleship. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. A little bit of rock and roll. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, we do a little tech support. We talk about what's going on in the world of technology, how it's changing, how, most importantly, it's changing your life, our lives, the world around us, the jobs we can get, the jobs that are available to us, how we play, how we work, how we worship, everything, right? How we communicate, most importantly. That's changed dramatically. There's a good website, kind of the steps to take to create a new user on Windows 10, because it's apparently uh, not as easy as it used to be. <laughs> the weird steps required to add a new user. I, ca I can't believe that that's actually the only way to do it. The control, you know, where you hit all, or rather Windows R, and you type control space user passwords too. You know, that method, A, I'm stunned that it still works in Windows 10, because we used to do that in Windows XP. And B, it really, it frosts me a little bit that Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom, decided to give us two different control panels in Windows 10. Like, there's one for normal people that's really easy but doesn't do anything. And then they kind of hide away the real control panel, like the old days control panel where you do the stuff that you want to do. That's hidden away. And it's and why two control panels? I don't... It's the, but they have two browsers too. They've got the Edge browser for for you know normal people, and then if you really want to do anything, the Internet Explorer browser that's still there. They just they just hide it. I just I I don't. I think some of this is because it's an old operating system. I know Windows 10, the newest hotness, but really it is an frankly an old operating system. And Microsoft, unlike some other companies, doesn't ever throw anything away. So what you really have. Is a, is a house that's got fresh paint. Maybe we remodeled the kitchen. But if you really look around in the basement and the attic, all the stuff that was there before is still there. <laughs> and, you know, maybe the wiring is kind of, maybe it's not, maybe, maybe it's more like knob and tube wiring than actual modern wiring, that kind of thing. But you wouldn't know unless you actually looked in the wall and then you said, wait a minute, what, what is that? Is that horse hair in the plaster? On the wall there? What is that? It's an old operating system. You wouldn't expect them to start from scratch each time. They're not going to do that. So they take the old stuff and they paint it over and they, they spruce it up. But you kind of don't really want to look under the floorboards because it's just a mess down there. This is why you see sometimes having a tech guy has been around for a few years. I started doing this show when it was Windows 3.0. Windows 3.0. So I have seen a few things. I've seen under the floorboards. I've been to the attic. And I've returned to tell the tale. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? We talk a lot about security, of course, on this show. And it's become, in the last few years, a real issue. Especially for people who use general purpose computers like Windows, Mac OS. But lately for Android phones, even iOS devices, security is a big issue. The other big issue we talk a lot about is privacy. Uh, you know, when you carry around a smartphone, your whole life is in there, right? I mean, really, everything. Uh, your computer, same thing. But the smartphone has some other features that make it even more of a target. It's got a camera that, you know, the bad guy could theoretically turn on at any time. It's got a microphone. It's GPS, so it could be used to kind of track you at all times. I mean... You ever watch a Jason Bourne movie? What you know? What's the first thing Jason Bourne does when when the scared woman gets in his car? I mean, and by the way, it happens in every Jason Bourne movie. The first thing he does, he takes her phone, rips out the battery, crashes, crunches it up, and then throws it out the window. Right? Because this is the best spy device ever. This smartphone in your pocket. So we talk a lot about security and privacy and, and how to secure your smartphone, how to secure your 
your computer. I really want to kind of talk about it. I mentioned I was going to do this uh, before. Cryptography, though. It's another way to protect your privacy. That's scrambling the message so that only you and its intended recipient can read it. And we've come a long way in cryptography. We've gotten pretty good at it. So much so that even, you know, federal agencies with unlimited computer power can't easily or even with difficulty break these scrambled messages. That scares law enforcement. In the United Kingdom, they passed the Investigatory Powers Act, which some have dubbed the Snoopers Charter, that uh, requires Internet service providers to save a year of information about every customer, including what websites they visit. And it, it's got a clause that says, if possible, they should also be able to break through the crypto and read what you're saying in your emails and your messages it's a really a sweeping act. I expect something similar will probably be on the table in the United States. It has been in the past and all around the world. In Russia, it's illegal to have crypto. So now's a good time, perhaps, to learn a little bit about using crypto. It's easy if you know what to do. And I think I'm not alone in thinking this. I noted that the Signal Messaging Program, which is a really good messaging program that has full encryption built in, Downloads have gone up 400% in the last week. <laughs> All of a sudden, everybody's saying, I'm going to get this while I can. It's a free program for Android or iOS. And it works pretty well to keep prying eyes from reading your messages. If you want private messaging, that's the way to go. Now, you may know that the same protocol used by Signal is now used by WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Apple's messages, they claim, are uh, encrypted as well. And all of these are, you know, pretty easily used. In the case of uh, Facebook Messenger or Google's Allo, you have to say, I want a private conversation before it's a private conversation. All the other conversations are not private. But choosing a messenger with built-in encryption, like Signal or WhatsApp, is one way that you can kind of protect your conversations from snoopers. And snoopers aren't just law enforcement. Far from it. In fact, this is why we really want people to start using encryption. Bad guys also snoop. And uh, any backdoor that's put in encryption is potentially usable by bad guys. So we don't want to weaken encryption. It protects us against hackers as well as overzealous law enforcement. Email is a little more tricky, but you should know. And I hope you know this. When you send email, it's like sending a postcard. It can be read. It's not encrypted. It's, it's in public. And almost all email goes through multiple servers. So it, it, it's not private unless you take steps to encrypt it. There are email providers like Proton, a Swiss company, Proton.ch, or Proton Mail, I guess it's called, .cs, ch, that's uh, Switzerland, .ch, who say we do encrypt. But I would only trust encryption that you do, that only you know the key to. And there are good ways to do this with a tool called PGP. You might have heard about PGP. It stands for Pretty Good Privacy. It's now a commercial entity, but there is an open source version of it called GPG, which is short for GNU Privacy Guard. And the GPG tools really are great. If you want to try it on Windows or Mac, you can easily for free. For Windows, it's GPG for Windows. GPG and the number four Windows for for. Uh, Oh, Mac OS is GPG Tools. And these programs you download, you install. You have to use a compatible email client. That isn't always the case. And webmail is not. Webmail is not compatible. Webmail is absolutely in the public. If you use Gmail or Yahoo Mail, that mail can be read. Google's been talking about encryption for some time now, putting encryption in Gmail. And they never really did. And I think partly it's because... Well, they don't want you to encrypt your email. They, you, they, that's how they find out what you're interested in so they can serve you better ads. So Gmail's free, but that's because they want to gather the information in your email. So another reason why you might want to use encryption. You can use Gmail with encryption. You have to just encrypt the text that you want to send first, then paste it into Gmail. The nice thing about these encryption tools, GPG uh, and uh, PGP, is it's something called public key crypto, and it's really a brilliant Brilliant. I've talked about it a little bit before. Uh, innovation. In the past, if you were going to, if you were Julius Caesar and you wanted to send an encrypted message to a general out in the field, you would have to send both the message and the key. Usually, you'd use separate, you know, couriers and hope that the bad guys, your enemy, didn't capture both. 
That's called symmetric encryption. The same key is used to encrypt and decrypt. It's the same thing with the, the coder ring you, you get you hear on the radio. Hey, you're all too young to remember this, but you get, get the decoder ring in the mail and then you could encode and decode messages. But that's the same problem, which is that the decoder ring has is the tool that can be used to decrypt. If somebody gets a hold of that, your privacy or security are gone. Public key crypto works. It's so clever. A little differently. You have two keys. One, your public key should be shared everywhere. Because it can only be used in one direction. It can only be used to scramble messages, not to unscramble them. Oh, interesting. So I can I can broadcast my public key. I do. If if you if you go to my website, you'll see right at the bottom, I, I give you my PGP key. You click on the link and you'll have that key. You can add it to your keychain and you can send me private email. Only I can decrypt it because there's a second key, the private key, which I don't share with anybody. I keep to myself even password protected and that's what i use to decrypt so it's a key pair a public key that can be spread everywhere and a private key that only the recipient has by using this system we can send encrypted email to anybody as long as you can get their public key and by the way one of the things people do is they put their public key up on servers i put mine in my uh, my email signature i put it on my website there are key servers run by MIT and others that you can get somebody's public key that will let you send private messages. It's a little complicated at first, but once you've installed it and you got it working, it is very effective. And as far as we know, there's no way for anybody, bad guy or good guy, to read your email without the private key. So take a look at the GPG tools for Mac and GPG for Windows. Uh, install it with a compatible email program and, and play with it a little bit. If we all use it, then it's not a red flag. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another excursion into amateur radio history? This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. In our last installment, we saw how the FCC shifted from an initial VHF-UHF band plan that was radically different from today's allocations to a proposal which closely parallels the frequencies we have today. Amateurs were happier with the January 1945 plan over the November 1944 one as it restored our 10-meter band back where it belonged and gave us a full 4 megacycles at 6 meters. One person who was not happy with the January 1945 plan was Edwin Armstrong, inventor of the regenerative, super-regenerative, and superheterodyne receivers, and the father of FM. He wanted the FM broadcast band to stay in the 42 to 50 megacycle area. Instead, he suddenly saw it transferred up to 84 to 102 megacycles, which would make every FM station and receiver obsolete. He knew that David Sarnoff of RCA was behind this as RCA wanted television in the frequencies now occupied by FM. Sarnoff and the RCA engineers had an interesting argument. FM, they said, should be moved higher in frequency to avoid the sporadic E-skip. Armstrong fought back. He pointed out that FM, due to its capture effect, was less susceptible to skip interference than television, which used AM for the video carrier. He ran tests and submitted data showing that the skip interference to FM would be far less than imagined and certainly a fraction of what TV would endure. The ARRL, by the way, was in favor of moving FM up to the 84 to 102 megacycle area. To counteract the arguments that FM receivers would become obsolete by the move, QST in the May 1945 issue ran the schematic of a one-tube converter which Hallicrafters said they could build for $5.60. In late May 1945, the FCC announced the three alternatives that were being considered for the disputed 44 through 108 megacycle region. They were, in alternative number one, 44 to 48 megacycles. Amateur, we would have a 7-meter band under this proposal. 48 to 50 megacycles, facsimile broadcasting. 50 to 54 megacycles, educational FM broadcasting. 54 to 68 megacycles, commercial FM broadcasting. 68 to 74 megacycles, TV channel 1. 74 to 78 megacycles, aeronautical fixed and mobile. And 78 to 108 megacycles, 
TV channels 2 through 6. Alternative number 2 was as follows. 44 to 56 megacycles, TV channels 1 and 2. 56 to 60, the amateur 5 meter band. 60 to 66, TV channel 3. 66 to 68, facsimile broadcasting. 68 to 72, educational FM broadcasting. 72 to 86, commercial FM broadcasting. 86 to 104, TV channels 4 through 6. And 104 through 108 megacycles would be non-government, fixed and mobile. In alternative number 3, the proposed allocations were as follows. 44 to 50 megacycles, TV channel 1. 50 to 54, amateur 6 meter band. 54 to 84, TV channels 2 through 6. 84 through 88, educational FM broadcasting. 88 through 102, commercial FM broadcasting. 102 through 104, facsimile broadcasting and 104 through 108 megacycles, non-government fixed and mobile. Except for the 44 through 108 megacycle region, which was still up in the air, the 25 through 44 megacycles and frequencies above 108 megacycles were fairly well established at today's allocations. The only major exception was the 470 through 480 megacycle band, which was still allocated to facsimile broadcasting. The FCC indicated that tests would be run throughout the summer months to determine which alternative was the best. Reaction was quick to the proposals. Except for the ARRL, almost none of the major players liked alternative number two, so the choice lay between one and three. The ARRL found number two acceptable because it preserved our five meter band. Of the other two alternatives, the ARRL was strongly opposed to number one. A 44 through 48 megacycle, 7 meter band would have too much skip, was too close to our 10 meter band, and too far from 2 meters. In the end, the ARRL came out in favor of alternative number 3 because it was believed that the FM band should be as far as possible from our ham bands in order to avoid IF interference to FM receivers. Naturally, Major Armstrong was in favor of alternative number 1. He continued to make extensive tests and bombarded the FCC with the results. However, Armstrong never realized that the political clout of General Sarnoff and RCA could overcome any test results. The Major thought he had the summer to complete his tests. Instead, on June 27, 1945, the FCC decided on alternative number three with a few minor changes to bring the allocations in line with what we have today. FM was definitely at 88 through 108 megacycles, and amateurs had a new 6 meter band at 50 to 54 megacycles, nestled snug between TV channels 1 and 2. Armstrong was stunned, but he didn't give up. As late as 1947, he was still submitting data to the FCC in regards to the effect of skip on FM broadcasts, but it was too late. For a period of time, there were two FM broadcast bands, as stations in the new 88 through 108 megacycle allocation coexisted with the older ones between 42 to 50 megacycles. But by 1947, the old FM band was a memory and sat waiting for Channel 1 to take over. However, a new controversy was brewing. With thousands of amateurs on our new 6 meter band and thousands of TVs pouring out of mostly RCA factories, a new concept was entering the amateur language. TVI. In our next installment, we will look at the TV wars of the 1940s and why ARRL wanted Channel 2 instead of Channel 1 eliminated. So, until then, I hope your 6 meter QSOs aren't causing interference to the Texaco Star Theater. Sites in Australia and South Africa have begun construction on the Square Kilometer Array Observatory, or SKAO, and astronomers are hoping to see the massive observatory's two antenna stations finished construction by May 2023, with the first dish commissioned in April of 2024, according to a report on the Space.com website. When the huge project is completed, it will boast a full one square kilometer collection area, and it will be the world's largest radio telescope. Construction began recently on the observatory's mid-array in the Cairo Desert in South Africa, which will scan for sources of radio waves from 350 megahertz to 15.4 gigahertz. 
The low array is also under construction north of Perth in Western Australia. It will use 131,072 dipoles seeking signals from frequencies between 50 and 350 megahertz. Applications are now being accepted for campers interested in attending Youth on the Air Camp 2023. With more details on the upcoming youth camp, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, reporting from League Headquarters. Licensed amateur radio operators ages 15 through 25 are encouraged to apply online at youthontheair.org. The Radio Amateurs of Canada will be the local host for the 2023 Yoda Camp. It's scheduled to take place July 16th through the 21st, 2023 at the Carleton University campus in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Applications will be accepted through May 31st, 2023, but for the best chance at being selected, applications should be submitted by 2359 Universal Coordinated Time on January 15th, 2023. The application process is free. However, a $100 deposit is required upon acceptance. If a camper is unable to pay the deposit, they may be able to apply for a scholarship or a waiver. Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, said campers are responsible for their transportation to the camp location, though some assistance may be available, and travel during the camp events is provided. A YouTube video is now available about the 2023 Yoda Camp. For details and additional information, contact Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, at director at youthontheair.org. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Campers will be selected by the working group and notified by February 1st. To encourage attendance from across the Americas, allocations for campers are being held open for various areas of North, Central, and South America. If countries do not use their allocation, or should someone with an allocation decline acceptance, those positions will be filled from the remaining pool of applicants. As this will be an ongoing process, everyone will not receive notification of acceptance at the same time. Preference will be given to first-time attendees. COVID-19 guidelines are still in effect and may have an impact on offering the camp. Currently, the outlook on offering the camp in July 2023 is positive. If the camp cannot be hosted or would need to be rescheduled, all applicants will be notified as soon as possible. Appropriate requirements on masking and vaccination statuses will be announced as needed. A YouTube video is now available about the 2023 Youth on the Air Camp. For details and additional information, contact the camp director, Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, at director at youthontheair.org. That email address again, director at youthontheair.org. I'm Byron Lee, KC9EEK. Every year, there's a forum at the Dayton Hamvention. It's called the Live Town Hall Meeting. Here's one such excerpt from this year's forum, featuring longtime ABC employee and former ARRL board member Steve Mendelson, W2ML, talking about ham radio's impact upon his career in the broadcast industry. He was introduced by forum moderator Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF. We met on two meters on a repeater called WA2SUR, as we called it, the sewer. For reasons that became very apparent if you lived in Brooklyn, New York, or in the New York City area back in the late 60s. Anyway, we're talking, of course, about Steve Mendelson, W2ML, who's spoken here many times. Currently in his 18th year as a senior systems design engineer with the ABC Television Network in New York City. Prior to that, he completed a successful 21-year career as the most traveled broadcast engineer with the CBS radio network did a lot of work with Walter Cronkite, by the way. And what he said that what made this all possible for him was his ham radio background. Steve is a resident of Dumont, New Jersey. He's been involved with FM repeaters and the like. But he's also done one thing. He's taken his knowledge of FM and repeaters and coordination, and he's brought it to the broadcast field. And I'm going to let him explain. Ladies and gentlemen, my buddy for more years than either of us will ever admit, Steve Mendelson, W2ML. Thank you, Bill. I'm Steve Mendelson, W2ML, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about my favorite hobby, ABC television. Oh, wait, we got some ABC people here. My favorite hobby, ham radio. I've been a ham for 51 years now. It's been my pleasure to have traveled with four presidents, Pope John Paul, several times. I have met virtually everybody that is anybody in Washington because they've come through in working with the various presidents that I've traveled with. This all happened for one reason, ham radio. Now, many people in this room have advanced degrees. I'm happy to say that I made it through high school, barely. 
I did, however, have DXCC in high school, which is why I made it through high school barely. A lot of my travels came about because of ham radio. When, uh, when I went into the Navy, they were looking for people that knew Morse code. Now, the average kid in the late 60s didn't know a lot about code, but the hams did. So I got involved. I was told that the Navy was actually a very large radio club by an ARL official, and I've been after him ever since. Four years later, I came out of the Navy after having been involved with naval cryptology. I was one of the people that was directly involved with some of these submarine trips that uh, you may have read about that went to, I guess you might call it, a neighboring country. We sat off of Murmansk under the water and we tapped an undersea cable. Now for years and years and years people thought that wasn't possible. A bunch of ham radio operators invented something called magnetic induction. We also, by the way, claim to have invented the speed of light and a few other things. These various things helped the government of the United States in its security efforts for many, many years, all done through ham radio. When I got out of the Navy, my father had the foresight to move next door to the video operator at CBS for a little show called The Ed Sullivan Show. You may have heard of The Ed Sullivan Show. What you don't know is that Bob Preck, the producer, in picking his technical crew, looked for only ham radio operators. And this is the beginning of a long stretch of, in case you don't know it, hams have a passion that is appreciated by people in the industry. Well, from there, I worked in television. I was a cameraman for almost eight minutes when somebody said, you have the eye of a blind man. So I became an audio operator. Two years later, I wound up at the CBS radio network because we had a huge layoff. Seems that there weren't that many people really needed in television. Something about some space cadet having killed off the entire industry. When I went to work at CBS radio, I went to work for a man named Bud Arno, who picked me out of six other engineers for one reason. He was W2BCM, I was WA2DHF. When he said that I was going to travel, I had no idea what he meant until he said your first tour is going to be with the President of the United States in a place called Paramus, New Jersey. And so I found myself traveling to Paramus with Gerald Ford and watching him address thousands of people at a huge gathering. Now, as most of you know, the average microphone works perfectly. Probably he had. There we go. I was boosted up to speak on top of the presidential limousine, and all I did was figure out how to put an XLR back in the microphone, something any ham could do. There is a picture at my house of the president holding my hand up and saying, this is the kind of guy that makes technology work in America. <laughs> All of this because I know how to put a connector in a microphone, proving you can fool a lot of the people a lot of the time if you're a ham. You're listening to an excerpt from the Dayton Hamvention Live Town Hall meeting featuring Steve Mendelson, W2ML, longtime employee of the ABC Television Network and former ARRL board member. Steve will conclude his talk in a moment. From there... I got asked to travel in 1978 with President Carter to South America and two countries in Africa. One of those countries was Nigeria. We traveled to Lagos, Nigeria, and I was asked to do the first ever ENG remote, electronic news gathering remote. I asked what kind of equipment we would be using, knowing that a 25 watt transmitter was pretty heavy, and the director of engineering said, well, let's see, they have no two meters there, so we're going to do it with your two-meter walkie-talkie and your two-meter base station. And so those people that heard a transmission from a moving ship, a moving speedboat with the president aboard, heard it on two meters, all because ham radio knew how to get it done. The gentleman at the receive site was another ham, and much to my shock and surprise, the Secret Service agents that traveled with the president were also hams. And when I asked the colonel involved why ham radio operators, he said, 
you guys know how to get it done. We think outside the box. All of the guys with the degrees formed the box, and then we proved time and again what can and can't be done. President Reagan, 1980 and 1983. The Pope touring Central America. Central America was a feast of two-meter repeater operation. My uh, buddy Wayne Wicks, who worked for ABC at the time, WA2KEC, brought the repeater. I brought all the walkie-talkies, and I can honestly say, if you had been in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, you would have been surprised had you turned on 146.73 to hear the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church addressing a crowd. Why? Because ham radio worked where commercial radio wouldn't. At some point, I decided it was time to stop traveling. That point was in 1989 when I was the transmission supervisor for the summit at sea between President Reagan and President Gorbachev. Why was I chosen? Because I was a ham radio operator. Because we had to get a Russian cruise ship, we had to get a Russian warship, and we had to get an American missile cruiser talking to each other. They couldn't do it except one way. Yes, we were on two meters again. And that two-meter operation taught me that my skills would better be served as an RF person and not just doing transmission. So I went from CBS to ABC to stop traveling. Because of all of my activities, the man that hired me said, boy, you know RF. You know, we got a group of people that really could use your skills. So I went to work for Monday Night Football. I'm a man of many hats, as you'll see. Monday Night Football, in those days, consisted of 20 cameras and a potload of people trying to figure out how to get back into the talents here on the field. So we invented the 450 megahertz band. And every truck that ABC sent out had no less than a dozen transmitters on various 450 frequencies. However, this time it was inside the country, so they were not on amateur radio frequencies. All of that worked well until basically 1999 when Monday Night Football left ABC. And my career in broadcasting was almost over were it not for the fact that another group of people decided that hams were the best thing going. I got my job not through the New York Times, as they used to say. I got my job through ham radio. And in 1999, with Monday Night Football gone, a group of people were put together by N3AW, Jay Gerber. That group of people did something that would profoundly change the entire American scene forever. We coordinated frequencies at football games. Now, I've been a DXer and a contester all of my life. We are tame compared to football fans. These people are out and out crazy. However, there's also 78,000 of them, and you really don't want to argue. And so in 1999, I joined a group of people who coordinate frequencies for the NFL. And in this day and age, my wife and I are frequency coordinators for the New York Jets, all of which I got through ham radio. Now, the point that we're all trying to make here at this forum, and the point that I want to make over and over, Ham's network, somewhere out there, a bunch of yuppies just got a cold shiver up and down their spines because they think they invented networking. They didn't. We did. We invented networking in the 1920s before they knew what networks were. We invented networking when we helped each other get jobs. And today, I just met three more hams who are going to be the Cincinnati Bengals frequency coordinators. There are 32 NFL teams. The 32 teams have a coordinator and a backup. I'm lucky my backup, of course, is a ham. My wife, Heidi, KC2LEQ. And we are the ones that are out there making sure that the broadcasters don't interfere with the coaches' belt packs. There are 10 coaches at every game on each side. Each one has a duplex belt pack made by Telex Communications. He said, looking at the national sales manager for Telex, you can guess who's paying for the hats now. In point of fact, frequency coordination in the NFL is done almost entirely by hands. 32 teams, 32 backups, that's 64 people, of which 49 are hands. When Super Bowl is done, this is a little known fact, Jay Gerber who is the national coordinator, he's the head of the coordination group, Jay goes to local ham clubs to ask for help. 
Why? Because ham radio operators think outside the box. We are a very adaptable group of people who make technology work for us. We don't work for technology. In every single case, I got my job through ham radio. Ham radio networking, best thing around. Thank you. That was Steve Mendelson, W2ML, former ARRL board member and longtime employee of the ABC Television Network, detailing Ham Radio's influence on his career. His talk was given during the Dayton Hamvention Live Town Hall meeting. I'm Byron Lee, KC9EEK, bidding you a very 73. Roots Page KK5DO is back this week with some AMSAT news, and Green Cube now has its Oscar number. It is IO117. Doug, KD8DP, has been tracking the stations using the digital satellite and says so far there are 303 stations active, 51 DXCC entries, and 194 unique grid squares. To listen and decode the satellite, you need the UZ7HO sound modem, which can be downloaded. The tone spacing is shifted from those of normal APRS conditions. According to Fabio, KF5VKV, he says use the SSB modem, 1600 main frequency in the spectrum, put the radio in USB, and no noise blanker or reductions. More information and a lot of blogs with tips and how to get started are available by visiting amsat.org. Scroll down to ANS and read the December 4th bulletin on General Cube IO-117. It is time for the weekly propagation forecast report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports this week that solar activity bounced back during this reporting week, which covered December 1st through the 7th. With solar flux and sunspot numbers dramatically higher and geomagnetic activity lower, what could be better? Well, even more sunspots. But this sunspot cycle is already progressing better than originally predicted. Average daily sunspot numbers increased from 46 to 85, while average daily solar flux rose from 108.3 to 137.5. The average daily planetary A index dropped from 18.6 to 14.4, while the middle latitude numbers declined from 14 to 9.1. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux for the next few days is high at 150 on December 10th and 11th, 140, 130, 120, and 115 on December 12th through the 15th, 110 on December 16th through the 19th, 115 on December 20th through the 22nd, and 120 on December 23rd through the 28th. Looking at the Planetary A index prediction, it will be 5 on December 10th through the 16th, 10 on December 17th and 18th, 5 on December 19th through the 21st, 20, 15, and 12 on December 22nd through the 24th, and 20 on December 25th through the 28th. This quick reminder, don't forget that the ARRL 10-meter contest is running right now this weekend. You can look up the details at ARRL.org stroke 10-meter. In North America, it started on Friday evening, and the latest prediction shows a promising high solar flux with low geomagnetic numbers. Ideal conditions. Good luck in the contest. In radio contesting this week for December 10th and 11th, the ARRL 10-meter contest, that's CW and phone, on December 10th, it's the POD XS 070 Club Triple Play Low Band Sprint. That is uh, digital. December 10th through the 11th, the TRC Digital Contest. Digital, of course. December 10th through the 12th, the SKCC Weekend Sprintathon at CW there. And on December 10th through the 11th, the ARI 4080 Meter Contest. That's CW Phone and Digital. December 10th through 11th, the International Naval Contest, CW and Phone. December 11th, the QRP ARCI Holiday Spirits Sprint Contest, CW and Phone. And also on December 11th, the CQC Great Colorado Snowshoe Run. That is, of course, CW. And in some updated uh, convention and state division conventions for December 9th and 10th, the Tampa Bay Ham Fest hosting the ARRL West Coast Florida Section Convention. That's in Plant City, Florida. On January 7th, the Ham Radio University hosting the ARRL New York City Long Island Section Convention. That is an online event. January 20th through the 21st, the Southwest Florida Regional Ham Fest hosting the ARRL Southern Florida Section Convention. That's in Fort Myers, Florida. And January 27th through the 28th, it's the Capital City Ham Fest 2023 
hosting the ARRO Mississippi State Convention. That is in Jackson, Mississippi. Foundations of Amateur Radio Having been able to call myself an amateur for over a decade, it might come as a surprise to you that it wasn't until a couple of weeks ago that I thought about attenuators for the first time. They're a curious tool, and once you come across them, you'll never be quite the same. Before I dive in, you should know that an amplifier is an active tool that makes things bigger, and an attenuator is a passive tool that makes things smaller. To look at, attenuators are diminutive, to say the least. The ones I have in my kit look like barrel connectors, a male and female connector and seemingly not much else. But looks can be deceiving, and I'll mention that shape isn't universal. The purpose of an attenuator is to reduce the power of an RF signal by a known amount, preferably without distortion or any impedance mismatches. When you go out hunting and gathering, your choice of connector is the first obvious selection. But soon after, you'll be asked for frequency range, an impedance, a power level, and an attenuation level. So let's take a look. I have some attenuators with N-type and SMA connectors. There's options for every connector under the sun. So consider what you're using with your gear, and remember to think about your measuring equipment connectors as well. In my case, my shack is pretty much SMA the whole way. But a friend had some broadcast N-type attenuators, and I was unable to resist. The next thing is impedance, in my case 50 ohm, but there's options for other choices like 75 ohm for TV-based attenuators. The purpose of an attenuator is to reduce power. It does so by converting power into heat, and more power handling means more heat. Too much heat and the attenuator starts letting out the magic smoke. So consider how much power your RF source is generating. Putting out 5 watts? then make sure that you don't connect a 1 watt attenuator to that radio. Now for the attenuation level. It's described in dB or decibel. At first the numbers look bewildering, but pretty soon you'll be familiar with how it hangs together. A 3 dB attenuator will half the signal, so a 10 watt signal will be reduced to 5 watts, and a 200 milliwatt signal will be reduced to 100 milliwatts. If you have a 6 dB attenuator, it will halve again, so 10 watts becomes 2.5 watts, and 200 milliwatts becomes 50 milliwatts. A 10 dB attenuator is a little more than 9 dB, so you could try something along the lines of a bit more than half again, but you don't need to. 10 dB attenuation is essentially moving the decimal point. A 10 watt signal with 10 dB attenuation becomes 1 watt. A 200 milliwatt signal becomes 20 milliwatt. If you have a 20 dB attenuator, it moves the decimal point two places. 10 watts becomes 0.1 of a watt, or 100 milliwatts, and 200 milliwatts with 20 dB attenuation becomes 2 milliwatts. You can connect two attenuators together and combine their values by adding them together. For example, combining a 10 dB attenuator with a 3 dB attenuator makes for 13 dB attenuation, which moves the decimal point and then halves that. All that's fine and dandy, but what's the point? Well, imagine that you want to measure the actual power output of your radio. If you were to pump the minimum power level of my Yaesu FT-857D into a Nano VNA, you'd blow it up. But if you added, say, 20 dB attenuation, that 5 watt would become 0.05 watts, or 50 milliwatts, which is half the power rating of the Nano VNA. If you're not confident that your radio is actually putting out 5 watts, you could add 30 dB attenuation and have a safe margin at an expected output of 5 milliwatts. I mentioned that attenuators don't all look like an innocent barrel connector. That's because if you have to attenuate something with higher power levels, you'll need a way to dissipate heat, in much the same way as a dummy load has cooling fins, higher power attenuators can come with cooling fins too. On the inside of this contraption is a simple circuit made from three or four resistors, which combine to attenuate your signal. If you're inclined to build your own, there are plenty of online calculators to be found that show how to put an attenuator together. One thing I've skipped over is the frequency range. Most of us are having fun with HF, VHF and UHF generally below 1 GHz, so most attenuators will be fine. But if you're playing at higher frequencies, you should take note of the frequency range specified for the attenuator. While on the subject of frequency range, 
you can easily measure the actual performance of an attenuator using a nano VNA. Connect port 1 to port 2 through your attenuator, and using the magnitude trace you can see just how much attenuation it provides. Be sure to set the intended frequency range and calibrate without the attenuator before measuring. Now that I know about attenuation, I cannot imagine a life without. But, to be fair, I was in blissful ignorance for more than a decade, so this might not apply to you. Yet. But one day perhaps you'll find yourself thinking about adding some attenuation to your toolkit. I'm on it. Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Using barely one watt of power, a station south of Perth in Western Australia made a record-setting one-way contact into North America on the 2200 meter band, which at 136 kilohertz is the lowest amateur band in Australia. The contact was made November 21st between VK6MJM and received in the United States by Paul KM5SSW in New Mexico. The distance was 16,164 kilometers and the power was 0.8 watts EIRP. The station was using a 5-minute key-down mode known as WSJTX FST4W 300 mode. It was a big moment for the Western Australian Low Frequency Experimenters Group, which operates the station. It is led by Peter Hall, VK6HP, and is affiliated with the Wireless Institute of Australia. The Radio Society of Great Britain is creating the volunteer position of Social Diversity Officer to help the board address inclusion and diversity within the ranks of amateur radio and the society itself. Some of the new officers' tasks will include helping boost society membership, but will also focus on encouraging hams of all ages and backgrounds to get their license. The RSGB is hoping that through creation of this new position, the society can complement the work of RAIBC, the Radio Amateur Invalid and Blind Club, which serves radio amateurs and shortwave listeners with disabilities. If the role of social diversity officer is one for which you would be interested in volunteering, please visit the Society website at rsgb.org slash volunteers. Application deadline is Monday, January 16th, 2023. Amateur Radio Digital Communications, or ARDC, has awarded a $16,500 grant to fund a modern amateur radio station in the soon-to-open Museum of Information Explosion in Huntsville, Alabama. John Ross, KD8IDJ at League Headquarters, has more on the story. Dan Rombacek, KB6NU, ARDC Communications Manager, said the amateur station will be staffed and maintained by members of local amateur radio clubs, including the Radio Club of the Museum, who will install and operate the equipment and serve as docents for the station. Licensed amateurs can use the station to try out new modes and techniques without making a major financial commitment. Specialized tools and test equipment will be available for use on site, said Romacek. Dr. Marcus Fendison, executive director of the museum, said they expect to open in early fall of 2023. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. The station will present a contrast between the modern digital technology and historic yet classic equipment found in the museum's other exhibits. The juxtaposition of old and new is designed to illustrate the accelerating evolution of amateur radio. Dr. Marcus Ben Dixon, executive director of the museum, said they expect to open in early fall of 2023, and visitors will be able to explore the history of communication, computing innovation, and how these technologies have shaped our modern way of life. The Museum of Information Explosion will allow people to explore the history of communication and computing innovation and how these technologies have shaped our modern way of life. In addition to the amateur radio station, exhibits include vintage telegraph sets, phonographs, radios, and TVs. Multimedia presentations will bring the stories of yesterday to life. An interactive, augmented, and virtual reality experience will ignite the imagination of young adventurers. Every guest will leave with a deeper appreciation of the history of information technology. For more information on the museum, visit mie-hsv.org. For information about the Radio Club of the Museum of Information Explosion, contact Chuck Lewis and 4NM.
I'm Greg Stoddard, KF9MP on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. After several years of poor service by the airlines, I decided this year to start taking the train whenever possible and making it a part of the destination. But let's be honest about long-distance passenger rail service in the United States. You cannot be in a hurry or expect your train to arrive exactly on time. There are lots of reasons for the state of long-distance passenger rail service, but probably the biggest reason is we're running passenger trains on tracks designed for freight trains. Since you'll generally have spare time on board the train, why not bring along your portable electronics and have some fun along the way? That's exactly what I did on my nearly three-day adventure. Amtrak runs through some pretty remote parts of our beautiful country, which means you'll have many hours each day in areas without any cellular coverage, and that translates into no internet for you. And Amtrak generally does not offer Wi-Fi service on any trains operating west of a line from Chicago to New Orleans. In fact, the passenger cars themselves are also different west of that same line. I already had the 100 VHF rail channels programmed into my tiny Yaesu HT and listened to the dispatchers and rail crews along the way, but the owners of the tracks also have voice annunciators at many mileposts operating on the same frequency as the nearest dispatch center. As the train passes by, it announces on VHF which track is in use, which freight company owns the track, and which milepost you just triggered. Those little transmitters are mounted on those red and green LED lamps along the tracks today and are usually powered by solar charged batteries. Each train has two telemetry beacons that send the train engineer data about the operating condition at both ends of each train. Despite all the RF and electrical noise, I had no problem receiving commercial FM and AM broadcasts, although my reception was reduced due to the shell of the train and the noise inside, and I could usually hear the dispatchers from 20 or more miles away with my little HT and its tiny rubber antenna. In many larger metro areas, the passenger train stations are below ground, which may also make contact by radio or cell nearly impossible. Some stations in downtown areas are surrounded by tall high-rise buildings, and at Amtrak stations there are often lots of overhead steel structures for wires and lighting, which can make good comms on any band to challenge, including cellular. In large cities, I had no problems making the repeaters in the downtown areas when we stopped at their passenger stations. The Amtrak station in downtown Dallas, Texas is only one block from the spot where President Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. That train passes very close to the Book Depository building, which is now a popular museum. But the biggest concern I had using my HT on the train was the possibility of theft. On long-distance passenger rail, there are basically two types of passenger cars, sleeper cars and coach cars. The sleeper cars are all divided into rooms with seats and bunks on both upper and lower floors of the train, but the doors don't have lock. When you're inside the car, you can latch your doors, but when you leave the room, there's no lock on the outside. The other kind of car is a coach, which is sort of like a giant bus on the inside, but the seats are huge with enormous amounts of leg and foot space, probably more than any first-class airplane seats ever have. But the entire car is wide open, end-to-end, -end, so using a scanner or HT would require the use of a headset or earphone of some kind. When I left my sleeper room, I slipped the HT under the pillow, and I kept the curtains closed on the windows looking out into the rail car hallway, because you basically can't steal anything that can't be seen. I never had any problems, but I still kept my HT quiet and concealed. A few rail employees saw the radio, but mostly ignored it, assuming I was one of those rail fans they see all the time. Although the cars are well sound insulated from the outside, there is very little insulation inside the car, so keep your volume low or always use an earphone. To sum up this episode, we learned that using an HT as a broadcast receiver does work, but not as well as your car stereo. Working repeaters by HT also works, and the added height from the two-story tall rail cars helps. Although the rooms don't lock, keeping an HT inside your room or at your seat can be done safely if you keep it concealed. Always use an earphone or headset on the train. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP in Phoenix, Arizona, on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. In last week's newscast, we told you about the triumph of the amateur-owned company that sent two of its made-in-India CubeSats, Tybolt-1 and Tybolt-2 satellites, into space aboard an Indian Space Research Organization rocket. Now, the company announced it is ready to join other enterprises in that nation in taking the next step. Dhruva Space, based in Hyderabad, 
announced it was moving forward to build a facility where it can assemble and test satellites as large as 100 kilograms. That's around 220 pounds. Co-founder Abhe Igor, the company's chief technical officer, said Dhruva is already raising funds toward that end. Dhruva joins another India-based space company, Pixel, which is building a satellite assembly facility in Bengaluru. Pixel expects that project to be completed during the first half of next year. Other companies are gearing up as well. Bangalore-based Bellatrix Aerospace, which is building in Karnataka, and Anjikul Cosmos in Madras, which is looking to develop testing facilities in Chennai. If you're starting to receive holiday cards from friends or eagerly awaiting the arrival of QSL cards from those treasured DX contacts, members of the Holmesburg Amateur Radio Club, WM3PEN in Philadelphia, are asking one more thing of you. Save the stamps, please. Hams in the Pennsylvania Club support these stamps for the Wounded Program, which accepts donations of stamps from around the world for use in occupational therapy programs in convalescent centers and hospitals where veterans are receiving treatment. Although the everyday United States Forever flag stamp is not needed for the program, all other stamps are welcome. Stamps should have at least a quarter-inch margin around them and should not be removed from the original envelopes. The Hams in the Club have been longtime supporters of the program, which was established in 1942 to encourage stamp collecting among the nation's military veterans who are at various stages of recovery. The program has more details on its website at stampsforthewounded, all one word, dot org. That's stampsforthewounded.org. If you wish to donate the stamps to help the club with their efforts, you can send them to Rich Shivers, K3UJ, 9029 Eastview Road, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19152, USA. Space Mobile has reached a milestone in its mission to build the first and only global cellular broadband network in space to operate directly with standard mobile phones. Having successfully completed deployment of its test satellite and communications array, Blue Walker 3 or BW3, in orbit. The goal of the network is to eliminate the connectivity gaps faced by today's 5 billion mobile subscribers and finally bring broadband to the billions who remain unconnected. BW3 is being billed as the largest ever commercial communications array deployed in low Earth orbit, spanning 64.38 meters in size, a design feature critical to support a space-based cellular broadband network with an expected field of view of over 776,996 kilometers on the surface of the Earth. It is designed to communicate directly with cellular devices via 3GPP standard frequencies at 5G speeds, testing the technologies that AST Space Mobile will need for its planned commercial service. The satellite comprises a large, flat, thin array built from identical components called microns. Solar cells collect energy on one side, and on the other side, many small antennas form a phased array. These antennas work together to form tight communication beams, which are an efficient way to push a strong signal from space to Earth. These beams of convergence are similar to those created by terrestrial cell tower and should help ordinary phones see BW3 without any modifications. The array can also hear standard mobile phone signals hundreds of kilometers away. With a high-altitude balloon transmitting KM4ZIA, the amateur radio call sign of 15-year-old Jack McElroy was launched recently in Antarctica. It became part of the atmospheric work being done by the University of Alabama researcher Todd McKinney, KN4TPG. Instead of just helping build the mathematical models of the atmosphere, however, Jack's balloon soon embarked on an incredible journey. For a little more a week later, its navigational equipment began to spit out a series of error messages on 20 meters. One observer in the U.S., however, realized that nothing was really wrong. He knew, in fact, that something remarkable was happening. Family friend and high-altitude balloon expert Bill Brown, WB8ELK, knew that Jack's solar-powered balloon was a short distance from the South Pole. Mapping systems could no longer determine its position from data being sent on 20 meters because of the densely spaced lines of longitude there are at the end of the Earth. Jack's father, Tom McElroy, W4SDR, said this is the closest any amateur radio balloon has come to the South Pole. Tom said Bill phoned the family home in Georgia that morning from Huntsville, Alabama on December 1, 
said Jack's balloon had literally gone off the map. Tom broke the news to an astonished Jack on the way to school. He said Jack had quite a story for his science teacher later that day. You can track Jack's balloon at APRS.FI using his call sign of KM4ZIA. This isn't Jack's first balloon either. He's launched several others over the years, including two years as a youth on the air camp in a team effort with his sister, Audrey McElroy, who's a KM4BUN. Rodney L. Linkus, W7OM, a giant of Pacific Northwest DXing and contesting, became a silent key on Wednesday, November 30th, 2022, reports Danny Eskenazi, K7SS. He was 88 years old. Linkus was first licensed in 1949. For the recent CQ Worldwide DXCW contest on November 26th and 27th, 2022, Linkus had over 500 QSOs running low power. In 2014, John Miller, K6MM, interviewed Linkus for the National Contest Journal. The Daily DX reports Linkus was instrumental in the Western Washington DX Club. Linkus had 340, 373 current total confirmed contacts in the ARRL DXCC mixed standings and 2,732 in the ARRL DXCC challenge standings. And finally this week, humans have left a lot of stuff in space. There is so much stuff that space junk has become a serious problem. Much of it is defunct satellites and orbits high enough that they can't simply fall back down to Earth. But just because a satellite has died, don't think it's all over. Six of them have demonstrated that sometimes satellites can spontaneously and unexpectedly come back to life. These revenant spacecraft orbiting our planet are known as zombie satellites. A zombie satellite can be any satellite that begins to communicate again after an extended period of inactivity. Usually, these devices lose their orbit or can't power themselves up, getting to a point where the ground can no longer contact them. And then spontaneously, they begin to operate again, or clever people on Earth manage to find new ways to establish contact. Let's start with a veteran of these zombie satellites. Transit 5B5 was launched back in 1965. Transit was a precursor to GPS, one of the first satellite navigation systems. To increase its longevity, the satellite is nuclear-powered and in a stable polar orbit, meaning its orbits between 60 to 90 degrees with respect to the equator. Operators are unable to control it, but its communications were heard long after transit was retired in 1996. Zombie might not be the exact term for Galaxy 15, a telecommunications satellite operated by Intelsat. Launched in 2005 with a 15-year mission, it drifted out of its orbital slot after the operator lost control of it in April 2010. Galaxy 15 seemed like a goner, but by December 2010, the satellite rebooted itself and Intelsat was able to place it back into its original slot. So it was fully brought back to life. Among the record holders for the longest gap between communications, there's AMSAT Oscar 7. Launched in 1974, this was an amateur radio satellite that operated for seven years. In 1981, a battery failure put an end to its mission, but 21 years later, in 2002, the satellite started communicating again. Amateur radio operators have actually played a big role in all this, and one among them, Scott Tilley in particular. He's responsible for receiving communications from the Lincoln Experimental Satellite, LES-5, originally launched in 1967 by the U.S. Air Force back in 2020. It only works when the solar panels are getting sunlight. A couple years before that, he was able to find the Image Satellite, another zombie satellite that had been lost by NASA in 2005. This week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to 
W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on nets and great repeater systems like our newest affiliates, the K2IWR repeater on 147.180 MHz in Cortland, New York, and the K2MST repeater on 443.150 MHz serving all of Syracuse, New York. We welcome them aboard the vast This Week in Amateur Radio network of repeaters and nets around the world. If your net or repeater carries This Week in Amateur Radio, why not let us know about it and we'll give you a free promo here on the air. All you need to do is put all the details into an email and give us the repeater call sign, frequency, area served, and the days and times that you carry This Week in Amateur Radio and send it off in an email to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you. That address, once again, is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We hope to hear from you real soon. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and OFCOM, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at TWIAR.net. And now, for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio Headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF.